Hello all, Rick here with a review of Star Trek Discovery's penultimate Season 3 episode, There Is A Tide. Spoilers ahead. I'm trying something new this week. I'm writing this intro to the review before having seen the episode to sort of capture my mindset. On the whole, I have enjoyed Season 3 so far, but I think Discovery has never nailed the landing on the end of the series. But this season has kept my optimism for longer than previous ones, which is a good sign. At the conclusion of the last episode, however, I was left with a feeling of apprehension that is very familiar to earlier seasons. The question of will they conclude this well, or will it go off the rails? Well, I'm about to watch the episode, so let's see. That did not go the way I expected, and I'm glad. While there was a large amount of action in this episode, the centrepiece was very much the negotiations between the Emerald Chain and Starfleet in a charged discussion between Vance and Osira. My major takeaway from last part was the lack of character development given to the leader of the Emerald Chain, seeing as she simply seemed to be a blunt instrument bully. But this episode did a lot to present her in a different light. It did this partly through the introduction of Invigilator Aurelio, her much appreciated scientific mind and someone she actually seems to consider a friend. It's not long before we learn that she stepped in to protect and help Aurelio survive, for which he is immensely appreciative. He is also someone from whom she actively hides the darker parts of her rule, although with how readily he listens to Stamets, he must have had his doubts. From what Vance presents and Aurelio's discussion, it sounds like life for some under the Emerald Chain is rather well off. It's just Osira and her ruling circle that are the issue. She targets lesser powers, such as those 50 pre-warp worlds, and strong arms them into cooperation, and undoubtedly rules through fear. Stamets' line underlines this fact when he says that she is both more than she appears, but exactly as she appears to be. Her desire to join the chain with the Federation is one that took me by surprise. I was fully expecting a showdown. She seems to be speaking the truth, or at least she believes in what she is saying and does raise some interesting points of argument for the current state of the UFP. She points out that the UFP needs to acknowledge that it adopts capitalism, which is a strange claim to make. While the Federation does not use currency and provides for its people, they do have a system of economics and privately run organisations such as the Daystrom Institute. At least they used to, that's probably been severely diminished. Likewise, the UFP does trade with other powers that are reliant on currency, again, well, used to. The thing is, Osiris' version of capitalism is not a healthy one, and directly comparing the operating of the Federation to current day politics is kind of difficult, as the UFP aims to be a utopia and the exact nature of the UFP's government is not revealed in full. I do like how she makes a passing remark at the human-centric nature of Starfleet, something that is an in-universe concern by observers caused by a simple real-world limitation. I'm also happy to learn that there is still a Federation president. For now, Admiral Vance seems open to the idea of cooperation with the chain, and is even impressed by the level of concessions Osira is willing to make. Apparently, she even aims to outlaw slavery within the chain. A move she says is supported by her people, but notably, this is something the Orion Syndicate also did when it suited them and look where they are now. Which brings me to the main point of the negotiations, and that's why they failed. Osira muscled her way to the conference table, giving Starfleet no choice but to negotiate, a calculated risk on her part as she knew that the Moral Federation would always seize the opportunity to talk, even if she literally barged into the dialogue. So this sort of false sincerity laces her negotiations. Maybe false sincerity isn't the right term, but what I mean to say is that her motivations are not based in compassion. She has been forced into dialogue with the UFP because of the status of the Emerald Chain. They lack dilithium, and I think she genuinely wants what is best for the populace under her control. So entering discussions with the Federation makes sense especially if they can provide a stronger network of support, but would she be looking for peace if she had ample dilithium reserves? I don't think so. 
She's simply adapting to retain power amid a changing landscape, and this is most seen when Vance brings up the fact that she wouldn't be able to be the one to represent the chain in discussions because of her crimes. At first, she attempts to wrangle a proxy ruler out, but when that fails, she downright terminates the negotiations at the suggestion she step down and face justice. A final proof that she is not as magnanimous as she claims to be, even believes herself to be. This is also why she shields people close to her, like Aurelio, from the worst aspects of her rule. She needs someone like him to validate that she is a good person, which then enables her to act in her perception of the greater good. I'm certain that this will be shaken up now that the scientist's doubts have been equally raised, and he's looking at her with a more critical eye. I think he still has a role to play beyond providing a new lens to view Osira through, and I'd perhaps like to see him involved in the reformation of the Emerald Chain. Which is another surprising statement I didn't think I'd be making. Prior to this, I suspected that the only way to deal with the chain was to break it. Reformation hadn't entered my mind really, but then the chain had only been portrayed as the cabal-like syndicate. The other strong focus of the episode was the relationship between Stamets and Burnham. During the interrogation of Stamets, we see him immediately attempt to humanise both himself and his captor, a classic tactic for survival in this sort of situation, although I winced when he revealed the location of Hugh in the Verubin Nebula, but it did encapsulate his state of mind. His only focus is to get the ship back to the Nebula before time elapses and Hugh, Saru and Adira too all succumb to radiation poisoning. Burnham makes the right choice to remove Stamets from the equation by getting him back into Starfleet hands, but it was difficult to see him being treated as a commodity and a risk by both the chain and Starfleet protocol. The confrontation between the two was strongly portrayed, and honestly I didn't find it forced, unlike some of the attempted weighty emotional moments in the past. The final straw for him learning Adira was gone too made it all the more impactful, and for the second time Burnham has to nerf pinch a fellow officer, but this time I actually agree with the decision. The reveal that the sphere data was protecting itself was foreshadowed earlier, as it disguised itself as old entertainment, but with it downloading itself into the DOT repair bots, it means we may have our very own Star Wars Astrodroid fleet. Still, nice to have a friendly AI this time. A couple of other points that stood out to me, the Orion text used throughout the episode was a good touch to add, and this is as depicted in prior Star Trek. The courier network of transwarp tunnels is a mess of damaged ships and debris, which I assume is a mixture of destroyed vessels caused by the burn and poor maintenance. It reminds me of the Underspace episodes of Voyager, and it's referred to as the courier network so I assume it was created for faster than warp services from even before the burn. So, this episode surprised me in a good way and provided some much needed background to the Emerald Chain. A little late in the series, maybe, but it makes an important difference. We'll see where things head for the finale. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. I've been Rick. Goodbye.